Good morning. I'm uh, Rob White. I'm the Alumni Communications Director, and I owe my only successfully completed marathon to the magazine published by our next speaker. Dave Willie of the class of 1989 and a senior vice president. There you go. <laughs> Is there someone else from 89 here? Is it the, the senior <laughs> and a senior vice president of Rodeo Publishers as editor in chief of Runner's World and editorial director of its sibling, Running Times. David caught the running bug while on a junior year, year junior year abroad in London and began marathoning after Williams during a brief banking stint in New York before heading to journalism school. In addition to previous magazine work, he's also worked as the on-course reporter for NBC's broadcast of the New York City Marathon. Uh, And since David took charge in 2006, Runner's World has been nominated for three National Magazine Awards and its website has become the most popular among runners worldwide. David's secret lies not only in the training tips and shoe reviews that attract so many running nerds like me, nor only in the global community of runners who have gathered around the magazine's remarkable website, but most importantly is his ability to engage readers with the human beings behind those little white number bibs. As he says himself, David has met amazing people who have overcome life's toughest challenges, disease, addiction, depression, amputation, all through running. Their stories are surprising, inspiring, and instructive, whether you're a runner or not. Please join me in welcoming David Willie, 89, to tell us all about running into remarkable people, inspirational stories from the world. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Loba. Thank you very much for that, Rob. What, what marathon, out of curiosity? All right, congratulations. I'm glad we uh, helped you through that. Um, and thank you also to uh, Brooks Vale for asking me to be here today. Brooks is, is also a runner. Um, we have, and, and, a, and a passionate Runner's World reader. Uh, we w- went running for uh, a couple really good runs last time I was in Williamstown, and, and um, it's a big honor. It's a lot of fun to be here doing this this morning. Um, we rolled in late last night, probably got to bed at about 2 o'clock. My wife, Kira, class of 91, is here with, um, with our three kids. So, um, it, you know, bunk beds, ah! Uh, so if, if, if we're a little foggy, if you, if you hear me using the same adjectives over and over again to describe some of these incredible people, um, uh, please forgive me for that. Uh, Rob, you did a great job of describing um, really what I think is the, the um, secret power of, of Runner's World and running in general, which is uh, the great stories that are out there. Runner's World is a, for those of you who don't know, Runner's World has is, is been around for 43 years. It's always been the, the Bible of running. Um, and the bread and butter of the magazine is to give training advice and nutrition, injury prevention, shoe reviews, all the things to help people become healthier and, and better runners. Um, but when I joined the magazine um, six years ago, uh, I saw a real opportunity to do more great storytelling, um, long-form journalism, profiles of people, narratives, uh, and I had no idea just how much of an opportunity there was. I thought it was there just because I was a runner and I'd been working in magazine publishing for a long time and um, narrative journalism is, is really something I care deeply about. It's even better than I thought it would be. Uh, and one of the reasons this job has been so much fun and so rewarding is because I've gotten to not only work on a magazine and a website uh, that is engaged in, in telling stories like that, which has become more and more rare in the media, uh, unfortunately, uh, but I get to actually interact with a lot of these people, and I've met many of them personally. Uh, the editors of the magazine spend a lot of time. Uh, we're based in, uh, in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, a very small town, a um, couple hours outside of New York. But we spend a lot of time on the road going to races, going to big marathons. Um, readers often come by the office to you know, go on the lunchtime run with us. Uh, so it's a pretty unique thing that I get to um, actually meet a lot of these people. So that's what I'm going to talk about um, here today and, and just introduce you to just a handful of, of the remarkable people that I've met. Um, and at, at the beginning, I just want to sort of mention a couple individuals because they represent lots and lots of people who are in the same situation. Um, and the, the thing that strikes you first uh, 
in this job and when you're meeting people like this is how many cancer survivors there are. There, there, have, to be, there have to be millions, I think, hundreds of thousands at least, um, who are cancer survivors who become runners after they have been um, diagnosed with cancer and they use running to beat cancer. Um, this is, is Judy Pickett, uh, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1996. At the time, she was 32, and she was a mother of three. Um, and five months after chemo, she set a goal to run 100 breast cancer awareness 5Ks. There are, there's a network of races all around the country that support um, cancer research, especially breast cancer research. And the, and the biggest one that some of you may have heard of is the Susan G. Komen um, Race for the Cure. And um, Judy decided to run 100 of those as a way to raise money for the Susan G. Um, Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. And she also founded her own running club called the Pink Ribbon Running Club. You've all seen those pink ribbons. You know what that all signifies. Um, In all, since that time, she's actually run more than 400 races. She travels all around the country. um, And this despite the fact that she um, had breast cancer two more times after that after that first diagnosis. So she's a three-time breast cancer survivor. Um, She's also a very good runner. She's won her division, the master's division, in 75 of those races. Um, Her PR is 18 minutes and 48 seconds, for for those of you who are running. How how many runners do we have here today? Are there? Right on. Um, 1848 is pretty fast. Uh, Judy says, every time I cross a finish line, I'm declaring that life after cancer is not just about surviving, it's about thriving. And it's that kind of attitude that um, you just you see again and again in this community, and you, you'll get a more of a sense for that um, here today as well. Um, Dottie O'Connor uh, was born with cystic fibrosis, um, which makes breathing and basically all physical activity very, very difficult. And ever since she was a kid, all she ever wanted to be was a runner, but she was stuck on the sideline watching all the other kids run. Doctors literally wouldn't let her run. Her, her lungs were just full of, of mucus, basically. Um, but she decided, even when she was a kid, that she didn't care what it took. She was going to become a runner someday. Um, and, you know, parents and doctors, when you hear kids say something like that, you know, the comp- compulsion is to sort of nod your head and encourage them, but um, perhaps doubt whether that would actually ever happen. Um, but when Dottie was 27 years old, she got a double lung transplant, which is an incredibly rare um, operation. And just seven months later, um, in 1995, she ran for the first time at age 27, and she basically has never stopped. Um, she has won several gold medals in the U.S. and Olympic transplant games in the long jump, 100-meter dash, 200-meter dash, and she's now training for a half marathon, uh, despite the fact that along the line there were complications with her health, and she also had a kidney transplant. Um, and was in a serious car accident in 2005 that um, basically almost killed her. But you, you just you can't stop her. Um, and again, she's emblematic of so many of the people that, that I've met. And she also founded an organization called Dottie's Dream, uh, which gives athletic equipment to kids with cystic fibrosis who, like her, want to be athletes and runners. Um, and that, that's another sort of recurring theme in, in these people is that almost... Every single one of them, in addition to uh, making changes to improve their own lives, they, they give back. They, they give back to causes that they have overcome themselves. They give back to the sport. They give back to the community. Um, this, uh, another um, really powerful um, source of, I guess, healing that running can be is for addiction, and Rob mentioned that as well. A lot of people... Um, kick alcoholism, other substance abuse problems through running. Um, and a lot of them sort of say, those of you who raised your hands probably understand that running can be sort of an addiction in and of itself, and it sort of just like redirect the compulsion sometimes, but at least it's in a healthier way. Uh, this, is, this is Todd Crandall, um, and for 13 years he was addicted to alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, crack, Valium, basically you, you name it, and he was on it. Um, he was a generalist, he likes to say. Um, <laughs> And most of the time, it was, it was fun for him, um, like the time he got drunk in Ohio and woke up in Georgia. Uh, but it also had its downside. He'd, he'd been in jail. He was homeless. He even attempted suicide. And he hit bottom in 1993 when um, 
my kids are here. I, I, I forgot that they were going to be here when I wrote this. Um, he passed out half naked at a Guns N' Roses concert um, and was arrested after um, um, doing something you're not supposed to do on a Jiffy Lube manager's desk. Um, that you're not supposed to do that. That's bad. Uh, a friend bailed him out, and he basically, that was when he hit bottom. He just decided that um, he, he didn't want that life anymore. Um, and he actually was drinking a, a glass of beer when he had this epiphany, and, he, and he, he finished that glass of beer, and he sort of put it down, and he said, I'm done. Um, and he began attending Alcoholics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous, and, and more importantly, he started running. Um, some, other, some other shots of... Uh, of Todd. He was a hockey player um, even during his addiction, so he had sort of an athletic background. He never was a runner, though. Um, but running and triathlons in particular really became the outlet for his addictions. Um, he poured everything into his bike rides and his runs and his swims, um, and he saw the Ironman on TV and decided that, that he was going to do someday run, run the Ironman. For those of you who don't know what that is, um, it is a two-and-a-half-mile swim followed by a 112-mile bike followed by a marathon. Um, and he has since done 12 Ironman um, triathlons and run several marathons. Uh, and he also founded Racing for Recovery, which is a group that promotes the use of exercise uh, to escape addiction. And this is one of the you know, tattoos that he has, as you can see, from addict to Ironman. Exercise gave me a positive outlet for my addictive energy, he said, and a new purpose, to make sure that fewer people follow in the sodden footprints I left as I muddied up the first half of my life. Still on the theme of, of giving back, just in a different way, and per, perhaps a much, much lighter note, um, this is Molly Barker, who, as a school teacher in her hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina, and she was a runner. She just started a little running group for, for girls in her hometown. She felt like um, that self-esteem was a, a really challenging thing for girls in a certain age group, age 8 to 11. And she knew what a powerful thing running could be, and it was powerful in her life, and she just wanted to share it with them. Um, and Runner's World um, did a little item on girls on the run in the magazine, and her phone just started ringing off the hook. Uh, and 12 years later, it's gone global, um, and it is now um, changing the lives of 50,000 girls in, in 150 cities. The way it works is uh, the girls meet with a coach or a mentor, a female coach and mentor, twice a week, and they train for a 5K, which they then all run together and bring girls in from different towns into, like, one really big event. And for those of you who've ever been to a road race, whether it's a 5K or a marathon, you, you understand how um, sort of powerful that can be in the sense of community and how fulfilling it can be to, to, to run a race, train for a race, run a race, finish it, and do it with all those other people who've done the same thing uh, that you've just done. Running is the space in my day when I feel the most beautiful, Molly says, when I don't feel judged by others, and that's what I want for all little girls. Uh, another person who's really kind of done something altruistic that is, is pretty impressive. It's a really terrific story. Uh, and we heard about it when we met her. She's from Philadelphia. This is Ann Mollen. Um, and she came up to the offices and, and told us about this new program that she had started. It's called Back on My Feet. Uh, and the way it got started is one summer morning a couple of years ago, she was running in downtown Philly, um, and she ran past a homeless mission. Um, and a handful of guys were standing outside, and they were more than a bit surprised to see a pretty blonde woman running around that part of town. They didn't see that very often. Uh, and they wondered if she was lost. Um, but they saw her the next day and then a couple days after that. And at one point, one of them finally just shouted out to her, Hey, runner girl, what are you doing here, runner girl? And it might have ended like that, but um, Anne, being the person that she is, she smiled and waved at them. Um, and then a couple days later, same thing played out, although this time she stopped and started talking to them. How are you guys doing this morning? And then the next day, as she was running by, she just, it just sort of occurred to her that, um, you know, in her words, she said, why do I get to be the runner and they, get, they have to be the homeless guys? Why can't we all just be runners? 
So she approached the mission with the idea of starting a running club at the homeless mission, which is something that had never been done before. Uh, and the idea was to, um, again, uh, get, get these guys running and active as a way to help them improve their health and turn their lives around. These, some of these guys were, some of them, addicts and some of them um, ex-cons and obviously were, were homeless and uh, she wanted to help. Um, most impressive, she put them all in a training program to run a half marathon. <laughs> She, uh, I'm telling you, this, people go like all the way. Um, these, um, not only did these guys not know how long a half marathon was, 13.1 <laughs> miles. It's one thing to know it intellectually, and it's another, as, as you runners know, to go out and actually train and, and do that. Uh, and over several months, she, she had several guys um, out training in the streets of Philly. Here they are running on the bridge um, to Camden, New Jersey. That's Anne kind of in the background there. Um, and man, they struggled, uh, but they 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 stuck with it, and they finished a handful of them. This is them before a morning run. They'd get up at like 5 a.m. to do their long runs uh, in the dark, and this is just sort of like a you know group um, psych session, I guess, before the long run. Uh, and a handful of them ran the Philadelphia Mar- Marathon in November. Um, and, and finished some of them in a very, very good time. This is Mike Solomon here, and he, he actually ran a 147 half marathon, uh, somebody who had never run a step in his life and, and had been an addict. Uh, and a lot of these guys are still running, and, and a, most of them, although not all of them, this isn't a perfect story, um, have turned their lives around and have left the mission and are living with their families, and um, lots of them have jobs, and, and they credit running with helping them get there. Um, and now there are five chapters of Back on My Feet in Philadelphia at other homeless missions, and more than 100 shelter residents have participated, and there's even a new um, chapter that's set to open in Baltimore very soon. Um, this, yeah, some you guys know? The, these are the Hoyts, Dick and Rick Hoyt, who are probably or arguably the most famous distance runners in America and definitely the most inspiring father-son team in sports. Uh, I've seen them at several marathon expos, and their booth always draws a huge crowd of admirers. Uh, Rick was born with cerebral palsy. Uh, the only parts of his body that, body that he can move, and this is even just slightly, are his head and his knees. Uh, but for 25 years, um, Dick, who's the father, uh, and Rick, together, have run more than 900 distance events all over the world, including 65 marathons and 81 Ironman triathlons. Um, for triathlons, Rick lies in a raft, and Dick has a harness that he puts around his waist and swims and pulls him along in the raft. Uh, and for the bike portion, Rick sits in a specially designed seat that rests on the handlebars of Dick's bike. Uh, and for the run, they have a specially designed wheelchair that you can see here um, that, that Dick runs behind and pushes. And, and that's, that's a 140-pound load for Dick to push, which makes it even more incredible that their marathon PR is two hours and 40 minutes. Um, Team Hoyt began kind of on a lark in 1977 when Rick was 15. And kind of out of nowhere, he asked his dad if they could do a five-mile road race that he'd heard about in their hometown of Westfield, Massachusetts. Um, Rick can't speak, but he can communicate with a specially designed computer that um, he chooses letters with a cursor by moving um, the cursor across the screen with, uh, using his head and a metal bar that's attached to his wheelchair. Um, and at the time, Dick was, was not a runner at all, and the race organizers didn't quite know what to make of this pretty portly guy, you know, wheeling his son up to the start in and, and just a conventional wheelchair, not a racing wheelchair. Um, they didn't expect him to get very far, but they let him, they let him run, um, and it almost killed Dick. But afterward, um, Rick tapped out on, on his computer, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not handicapped. Um, and Dick refuses to stop for that very reason. Um, and here are some shots of them competing in marathons. I think this, is this Boston? This might be... Um, Marine Corps in Washington, D.C. Um, just to show you that remarkable people who are runners are, are, can be, have a lighter side and a sense of humor. It's not all, you know, so, so heavy. Um, there are some really great 
sort of characters and even kooks out there in our world. Um, this is Neil Wygant, who is um, the, the foremost streaker in running, and I don't mean running naked. Um, he has run 42 consecutive Boston marathons. Uh, and because Boston is the oldest marathon uh, in, in the world, that means he has the longest marathon streak of any kind uh, in the world. He, and 23 of those have been sub-three-hour marathons, which is, which is pretty incredible. And he's um, the leader of this group called the Quarter Century Club, 36 men and, and one woman who have run 25 straight marathons. Um, it's a great group. Sometimes this is the only race that they do all year, but you get the sense that um, they're not going to stop until you know, they're, um, they're feet up. Okay, I told you they were kooks. This is, um, this is Dennis Marsala, a.k.a. the Coat Man. Um, and he, we called him the king of the stunt runners. Um, and he's, he, he, he's accompanied by countless running Elvises that you see at races, uh, jogglers, who are people who run marathons jog- juggling balls the whole time, um, a running Gumby, You'll be glad to hear it, Gumby. And of course, compare, um, accompanied by a running pokey. Uh, and also countless running blues brothers. And um, unfortunately, there is someone called the Naked Man who wears only a rainbow wig when he um, <laughs> runs races. But Coat Man is the most prolific. Since 1981, he has run more than 100 marathons wearing this ridiculous outfit. Um, it's, a, it's a heavy denim jacket. Here's a closer look at it. Um, and um, he also, in 1995, began carrying the pizza box and the bottle of champagne that you saw. Um, and I've run in races, and I've seen him. So that he, he really does this. I can personally vouch. Um, usually it takes between four and five hours, uh, which isn't bad, considering that he also runs in um, those black wingtips that you see him wearing there. Uh, I wish I could explain why he does this, but I can't. We, we did a profile of him, and we tried to understand why, and, and, and he can't really explain why. I think it, big surprise, it's really just an attention-getting thing for, for Dennis. Um, he did the first one in Miami, which is where he lives. You see, that's where he is here. Um, just on a lark, and someone yelled, go, coat man, go. And he just realized that he loved the attention, um, and now he wouldn't dream of running any other way. Uh, so an, another kind of category of, of people um, that I've met and that are really notable in the running world are, are pioneers, you know, people who um, kind of break new ground and tear down barriers and, you know, all kinds of cliches like that. Uh, this is Catherine Switzer. Um, as recently as 40 years ago, 42 years ago, I guess, women were not allowed to run marathons. Um, people thought that all kinds of awful medical things would happen, that your wombs would fall out, or just crazy, crazy stuff, but it, but it was real. Um, and Catherine, who was a student at uh, Syracuse, um, and she took up running. She was, she was a really good athlete, and she was running. She was a good enough runner that she would train with um, the men. And the coach that coached the men began coaching her, and all the guys back then ran the Boston Marathon. It was just what you did. There were far fewer marathons back there, and Boston was the thing to do. So she decided she wanted to run the Boston Marathon just like all her training buddies could. Um, But they wouldn't let her register because women weren't allowed to run the race. So um, she decided to give it a shot anyway. So she just showed up in 1967. She registered as K.V. Switzer, so initials, um, put on the, this baggy outfit that you see, and surprisingly, nobody recognized her as a woman, despite the the hairdo. And she she also had lipstick on. But you know, she she claims that she wasn't trying to fool anybody. She was just going to sort of show up and run and make them make them stop me kind of thing. And they they didn't stop her. Um, although pretty quickly, um, the press truck found her out. And the at the time, the race director of the Boston Marathon was a guy named Jock Semple, who is this really fiery Irish guy. And he took his race very, very, very seriously. And he was not at all pleased that um, K.V. Switzer had snuck into his race. So he got on the press truck, and they caught up to Catherine and the group that she was running with. And he jumped off the truck, screaming at her, 
Um, what did he say? Get out of my race, my race, and give me that number. And he literally tried to go and rip the number off her, off her sweatshirt there, as you can see. Um, unfortunately for Jock, the guy on the right here is Catherine's boyfriend, who played football at Syracuse. <laughs> and um, I wish I had the next few frames of, of what happened here, because it's, it's really awesome. He, he, he put a, a crossbody block on Jock Semple that um, Coach Doyle would be very, very proud of. Um, and this thoroughly freaked out Catherine, of course. Um, and she thought about stopping. And the reporters on the press truck then jumped on her again. This happened relatively early in the race, so she had at least 15, 16 miles to go. Uh, and they were asking her, when are you going to stop? You know, this is ridiculous. What are you doing out here? But she decided that she couldn't stop. I mean, she, one of the reasons that she wanted to run for her own reasons personally, but once all that happened, she realized that if she pulled out and if she let Jock Semple knock her out that way, that it was going to kind of prove everybody right, that women weren't cut out to do this. So she decided that she absolutely had to finish this race, and she did. Uh, and after she finished Boston, she led a campaign to get official status for women in, in distance races in America. Um, Boston finally allowed women in 1972. And obviously, this completely revolutionized the sport. It, it, it wasn't something that she did just for elite runners. She was very good. She ended up winning the New York Marathon. But it opened up running to, to all kinds of women. Um, and the the growth of running is booming right now by the way i think it's one of the um really truly either recession proof or recession resistant industries out there people are running more than they have ever run um there are more people running races races are filling up faster than they ever have uh and a lot of the growth in the sport is due to women especially young women who are coming out of college and the post title nine generation and um really all of that goes back to Catherine switzer um, another pioneer, this guy's great, this is Ed Whitlock. Um, he is now 78 years old. He's a retired mining engineer from Canada, and he has completely rewritten the book on aging and athletic performance. He holds a world record for every distance for runners over the age of 70, from the 5K to the marathon. Uh, and he was the first person ever to run a sub-three-hour marathon after turning 70, which he's done three times now. Um, he admits that his success may be partly genetic. His uncle Arthur lived to be 107. But really what's remarkable is his, his training routine. He runs once a day, every day, a three-hour workout, about 20 miles, in this cemetery near his hometown in, in Toronto. <laughs> Great symbolism, isn't it? He's just like... You're not going to get me. <laughs> he is um, he's incredibly self-effacing, he's, and he even gets embarrassed when people call him an inspiration. Um, and he says that his primary ambition is races to, quote, avoid disgracing myself. Um, this is a great letter that we got from a reader after we did a story on, on Ed. Um, so this is from a reader. I used to have pictures of Rambo, Rocky, and Dirty Harry on my walls to help me visualize my physical and mental objectives but I've replaced them with Ed. Um, his times are way, way out of reach for really anyone under his age, but his larger message isn't about um, world records. Uh, he says, our performances tend to leak away as we get older, but we don't have to slow down as much as some people think. If we keep active, we can accomplish a lot. Uh, a pretty simple and, and great message, I think. This is um, Sarah Reinertsen, and this is, this is, we put her on the cover in our, in our first Heroes of Running issue uh, in, in 2004. I'm sorry, the cover lines are off of here. And um, we've never gotten more requests for reprints or people just to send copies of this cover. In fact, the print run is completely gone. You can't even, if, if you don't have one of these issues, you, you can't get it again. Um, and more and more people tore this off, put it on their refrigerator, put it on their wall, I think, than any other image that, that's run in the magazine. Um, when Sarah was seven, her leg was amputated above the knee because of a tissue disorder. Um, she was very active and athletic before that, but she was told she would never be able to be active again or, or to run. Um, her parents got her a fairly crude prosthetic leg. The technology was uh, pretty basic back then. Um, 
and she wanted to play sports and she tried, tried to play soccer, but her coaches, she had some, you know, coaches, unfortunately, who, who wouldn't let her, who, who kept her on the sidelines and kept telling her that she couldn't do things. Um, and very much like Dottie O'Connor earlier, um, this ticked her off and gave her an, a really indefatigable attitude to prove that she's just like everyone else. Um, and she just refused to listen to them and refused to give up. So um, her parents got her a slightly better running prosthetic, and she started running um, at age 11, uh, ran her first marathon in, in 1997, and then started doing triathlons. And then in 2005, she became the first female amputee to finish the Hawaii Ironman. Again, 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike ride, and a marathon. Um, she doesn't wear a prosthetic leg when she swims, but then she has to put on a running leg that she has to run to the transition area and then put on a different biking leg that has a cleat clip to the bottom of it to do the bike leg, and then her, someone puts her running leg at, that, at the next transition, and she puts that leg on and then um, does the run. Um, I met Sarah for the first time right after we did this, this story on her in 2004, and she's like yay tall, and it's, uh, it's the first time I've ever met anyone, and, and literally like the word superhero came and in, in, popped in my head. She came to our booth at the New York City Marathon Expo wearing this exact outfit, <laughs> and she's a superhero. I mean, she's just like, you can see how strong she is. She just, she just like radiates ath- athleticism and strength, and she is just a magnet for people. There's immediately a crowd around here. And um, this really launched a whole career for her. She's become a motivational speaker. Some of you may have seen her on The Amazing Race, the television show. I think it was about a year or so ago. Um, Just because she just has this incredible um, motivational power. There's a great shot of her her running. Um, There are so many more amputee runners. I think there are more amputee runners than there have ever been. Um, partly because the technology has gotten so good, but also because of people like Sarah. Um, and after we did this story five, five years ago, um, the ripple effects were in, incredible. Like I said, that picture was up on more walls than any other image. And she started inspiring other people he, who either were amputees themselves or, in, in the case of Tom White, a sort of more interesting twist. Um, this is a shot of Tom uh, just last fall. Uh, in college, he was a nationally ranked cross-country runner, a very, very gifted competitive runner. Uh, and the summer before his senior year, a drunk driver hit him while he was on his motorcycle, and his left leg was nearly severed. Um, he begged doctors to save it, to reattach his leg, saying, I- I'm a runner, you have to save my leg. And they weren't sure they could, but, but they did their best, um, and they did. They, they reattached his leg. Um, but it was severely damaged. Here's a shot of him, um, actually not too much earlier than the photo you just saw. But you can see how kind of deformed his left leg is there. And f- for 20 years, that's what his leg was like. And he kept running. I mean, to, he, the idea of not running was just inconceivable to Tom White. Um, he just kept at it. He ran marathons, ultra marathons. He ran several days a week with his wife, Tammy, who's a runner. But Starting three years ago or so, the pain was, was starting to get worse. Um, they have kids. He's a, he's a, he's a pediatrician in, in Colorado. He's a coach. And for the first time in his life, he was not able to run. The pain was just, was just too bad. Um, he had met Sarah Reinertsen at that New York marathon that I mentioned. And he had seen other amputee runners and athletes kind of in the culture since then. Um, and he was just blown away by, by them. And so he made um, a pretty remarkable decision to have his leg preemptively amputated, even though there was no medical reason to do it at all. It was just because he couldn't run anymore. So to him, um, amputation wasn't going to be a loss of something. It, was, it, would, it would be about regaining something, um, his running life, which was important enough to him to, to do this, to have his leg cut off, basically. Um, it's incredibly hard. So, so he did that um, last year. Here he is um, just, just before the surgery. And um, here he is. As I said, he's a coach. And he really struggled for a year. It's, it's unbelievably hard to learn how to just walk in a prosthetic leg 
let alone run. It's excruciatingly painful. Um, you can imagine the, the, the blisters and the chafing and um, the pain that comes with that. But the psychological part really takes a different kind of courage. Um, you have to get used to like snapping your leg off in public if you need to um, dry out the sweat or something if you're running. Um, and just the feeling that you've, you're being stigmatized and stared at all the time. Uh, and it took, him, it took him eight months to really get close to being back to where he wanted to be. Here's a shot of him running with uh, the high school girls that he coaches. And he wasn't able to go out on these runs with these girls anymore, and that was sort of um, the last straw for him. Um, and it really kind of, things kind of came together for him on a, um, on a 10K race that he and his wife, Tammy, ran in France. Um, and I just want to read a little bit from the story because it, um, I, think it's, I think it's pretty great. Uh, his ears became, so this is during the race that he's running with his wife, and he's not sure he can make it. He's never run 10K, six, which is 6.2 miles. He thought maybe he'd run halfway and then drop out, but he just kept going and kept going. Um, he was feeling a little bit better, very tentative. Uh, he continued on. His ears became his coach. Since he couldn't feel his foot strike the ground, Tom had to listen for the sound. When he tired, his footfall made a sliding sound. For the last three kilometers, he concentrated on making good strikes, good sounds. And that's when he felt it, a little bit of that old rhythm. When he was a kid, before the motorcycle accident, the rhythm of running was his biological clock. Back in those days, if he ran long enough, with a proper frame of mind and respect, he could slip into the rhythm and transform his body's movement into a mystical experience. It was like a scent from childhood, a sense memory, of which he caught just a trace up there among the Edelweiss. This is in France. That's what he missed the most all those years. That's what he gave his left leg to get back again. And then the finish was upon him. Tammy, Whitney, and his, did Jasmine, his other daughters, screamed his name. They dashed onto the course and ran the final 50 yards alongside him. He hugged his girls and felt them crinkle his race bib. Around him, runners caught their breath and checked their times. Tammy offered a smile. He savored the world opening up around him and the feeling, once again, of being whole. Um, back, to, back to legends and... and um, one of the great things about running is that there's such a rich history um, at, as, a, as a sport. Um, my dad was a, a proud member of the first running boom in the, in the 70s, the high-cut short shorts, the gray New Balance shirts, the you know, race, race T-shirts that have holes in them, the whole deal. Um, and he, when I was a kid, he used to try to get me to go out running with him. And every once in a while, I would. And then I'd remember why I never did all those other times. It was miserable. Um, <laughs> As Rob said, I really didn't even become a runner until I was here and until I was abroad um, my junior year. Running always for me was a means to another end. Either I, I grew up playing sports and played football here for four years. So running was always about getting in shape or punishment, you know, run a, run a lap, run gassers, that kind of thing. Um, and I didn't understand really what running was. Um, and like I said, there's, there's, a, there's this incredible tradition of... Um, people and races and um, experiences to draw upon. Um, and one that I just want to mention is, again, sort of an archetype of all the other people out there, like um, Frank Shorter and Bill Rogers, is, is Joan Benite Samuelson. Um, Joni uh, is probably the most famous and iconic female runner in the world, even still at age 51. She grew up in Portland, Maine, dreaming of becoming a skier, but she broke her leg on the slopes, and while recovering, she started running. And by her senior year in high school, she was the state champ in the mile uh, and had run her first ra won her first race of 5K at age 16. So obviously great things were in store. And here she is in 1979. She was still a senior at Bowdoin. You can see her Bowdoin jersey there. Um, out of no nobody even knew who she was. She won the Boston Marathon. Um, you know, what, um, seven years after Catherine Switzer sort of broke down that door. Um, she ran, ran it in two hours and 35 minutes, taking eight minutes off the course record. Um, my favorite part is that she did it while wearing her Red Sox hat the whole time. <laughs> I'm a big Sox fan. Um, she won Boston again in 1983, this time breaking the world record in two hours and 22 minutes. And most famously, she won the first ever um, women's Olympic marathon in 1980. Uh, the Olympics was much, much slower than other races in 
breaking down the gender barrier. Women were not allowed to run the Olympic marathon until 1980, if you can believe that, for all the same reasons. Um, and so this was a very big deal to even have a women's Olympic marathon. Um, in 1980, the Olympics were in Los Angeles. So it was on you know, U.S. soil. And um, Joni basically ran out from the, from the start and led the whole way. Um, and this is probably, well, she says that um, it was the biggest win of her life. Uh, and, all, and went even further than um, Catherine Switzer went to bringing women into the sport. And, you know, the Nike posters of Joni saying there is no finish line, you know, were in, on thousands and thousands of young girls' walls uh, beginning in the 70s. Um, even though this was the biggest win of her life, lesser known um, was the race she had to run to get there, which is the, the marathon trials, which she says to this day was the race of her life. Um, she suffered a knee injury before the trials and had knee surgery 17 days before the race. Um, she had barely, I know these, it's incredible. Um, she had barely run it all beforehand and had no idea if she could even make it 26 miles. Um, but just like uh, in L.A., she won uh, running away. Um, maybe what's most amazing about Joni, and so many things are, is that she's qualified for every single Olympic trials since then. Nobody else has ever done that. She's the oldest trials qualifier in, in history. Here she is this past April in Boston running the women's Olympic marathon trials. They're run every four years. Um, she said that she wanted to run under two hours and 50 minutes at age 50, which no one has ever come close to doing. 50-year-olds um, don't run the trials at all, let alone run that fast. Uh, and she said it was one of the biggest challenges she's ever faced and the most pressure she'd ever put on herself. Um, I was, this is on the Mass Ave Bridge. I didn't take this photo, but I was standing right near there. Um, and it was a really exciting race. Um, there was a surprise breakaway leader and a dramatic chase by the winner, Dina Castor. And Joni didn't come close to winning. But the loudest cheers far and away um, were for Joni. The, the leaders would go by and then some other people following the leaders and then it would be kind of quiet. And then you'd hear this sort of wall of sound start to rise up. And then it would reach you know, its peak as Joni was right in front of you and she'd run by and then the wall of sound would subside. Um, and there are these guys. Um, she was the only runner to have her name spelled out on the naked torsos of some <laughs> perhaps slightly inebriated undergrads. Uh, and after turning onto Boylston Street for the straightaway, she, um, she put on her Red Sox hat again and, and crossed the line in just over two hours and 49 minutes. Um, so she, she reached this goal that even she doubted she could make. Um, and she said it was going to be her last marathon, but you, you, you just can't, you can't trust Joni when she says things like that. Um, she still feels very competitive and has a hard time just stopping. Um, and she quietly has been sort of ticking off age group records in all kinds of different uh, race distances from the 5K on. Um, and for her, it's all about setting goals. It's not necessarily about making records or keeping trophies. It's, just, it's the importance of setting goals, she said, and then reaching them and then continuing to, to look for new ones. She came, this was a week after she ran that in Boston. She came, um, which proves another great thing about her is, and how supportive she is of grassroots running. She came to the local half marathon in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where Runner's, where Runners World is. Um, because this is what she does. She travels around supporting running. Um, and, and someone told me that she was, she was pretty wiped out from, from um, Boston and that she might you know, be running kind of slowly for her. Uh, and and I, was, I, would, I had been training a lot, and I was in pretty good shape, and I was hoping to run under 140. So um, we had dinner together at the pasta dinner the night before, and we started talking about maybe running together the next day. And, you know, again, Joni was, like, poo-pooing how fast she was going to run. And she asked me what I wanted to do, and she said, yeah, okay, well, let's, let's meet up at the starting line. Thank God we never saw each other at the starting line. <laughs> um, she, she started, you know, from the beginning, obviously. I was a little bit further back. I was a little bit late getting there. Um, and for the first couple of miles, I was asking people, has anybody seen Joni? I was trying to catch up to her. And it's a, it's a turnaround course, so I think at, like, mile five or so, um, the, the, the course comes and turns around. So, you know, the, you run past the leaders, or the leaders run past you more specifically. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe Joni's up 50 yards or so, and the turnaround point comes, and here she comes. She's winning the race. Um, and I, if I had, you know, I couldn't have made it ha half a mile, I don't think. Um, and 
she, she um, after the race, spent a lot of time with us and, and with the kids. She ended up running a 123, by the way, in that race. But she was, she was most happy afterward by the fact that I barely got under 140. Um, and she said she liked my hat, too, which, which made me especially happy. But she, she gave her trophies to our kids, Lola and Tristan, um, which they keep in their rooms. And on them she wrote, Live Your Dreams. Uh, and I think that's done as much uh, as anything I've ever done to in- inspire these guys to perhaps run themselves one day. Um, Joni helped this guy out a lot. Um, obviously, you all know who Lance Armstrong is. Probably the highest profile, most famous cancer survivor there is, who became a runner um, a couple years ago after he retired, at least for a while, retired. Um, from cycling in 2006. He decided he wanted to run the New York City Marathon. Um, And we did a story on him, put him on the cover. I went down and did an interview with him um, for a training run in in Portland, Oregon. They wouldn't let me run with him. He's running with his coach and somebody from the Lance Armstrong Foundation here. I don't know why they wouldn't let me run along with him. I don't know what they thought I was going to do to him. Um, So I was riding along on a mountain bike, um, and a photographer was there t- taking pictures. And it became pretty clear to me that Lance was not training at all. Um, he was not taking this marathon very seriously. Um, and sure enough, he showed up in, in New York and um, claiming that he had run, uh, done a couple of 16-mile runs in training, which isn't enough. You're supposed to do at least a couple of 20-milers, ideally. The truth is that he'd only run 13 miles. And the, the marathon did what all those Tour de France races, and the Tour de France is, by acclaim, the most grueling race of any kind there is in the world. It brought Lance to his, to his knees. Um, I'm sorry to laugh, but runners really took perverse pleasure in the fact that the marathon just broke Lance Armstrong. But I'm not ragging on him totally. Um, he, he said he wanted to run under three hours, which is an incredibly audacious goal for a first-timer, even an athlete like Lance, who, who really had a cycling body, um, very, very strong legs, and just, just isn't built to be a runner. Um, he, he, thanks to Joni, who paced him for the last few miles, made it by 22 seconds, which is really incredible. And all the runners who were sort of skeptical of Lance and thought he was doing this as a publicity stunt and maybe were you know, a little bent out of shape that he was treading on the running space. Everybody was incredibly impressed by how he gutted it out. Um, he said it was the hardest thing he'd ever done, including the Tour de France. Um, his ex-wife, Kristen Armstrong, is, she writes for the magazine, and um, they're, they're still in touch. And he sent her a text message right after the race, um, and the entirety of the text message was, Oh, my God. Ouch. Terrible. Um, but he didn't quit, and he, he trained right and ran New York the next year. Here he is at, um, at the finish line looking much, much fresher. Um, ran New York in 246 and then ran Boston last year. Uh, and in addition to just having you know, a really high-profile person known for another sport come into running being exciting, um, I, I have also seen firsthand, and this isn't news to anybody, this guy inspires more people than, than anyone I've ever seen, especially cancer survivors. Um, you go to these dinners where he is and cancer survivors are, and he, he just, just by taking up running one year, he brought more people into the sport than I think any other single act uh, you know, in the past two decades. Um, on to other elite athletes. And another terrific thing about running and about editing a runner's world is that running is so many things. I, I think I said this earlier. It, it's, an, it's a sport with elite athletes and incredibly sublime athletes and big races, competitions, Olympics. Um, you can run the New York Marathon and follow in the exact same footsteps of the very best runners in the sport. You can't do that in anything else. It, it, it's like you know, playing the Masters a couple foursomes behind Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson. It just doesn't happen in other sports. Um, and it is all these other things. People, running means different things to different people. Just, for some, it's just a way to lose weight, blow off stress. Um, but there is an incredible group of amazing athletes uh, in this sport. And American distance running has been on the decline for a while as the um, East Africans really um, have, have 
taken over the sport um, or, or dominated the sport is a, is a better way to say it. Um, but a grassroots effort to restore American distance running has been in effect for a few years now. This is Ryan Hall, who is the best um, distance runner that, that, we, that America has seen in generations um, and the most electrifying since Alberto Salazar, Bill Rogers, Frank Shorter, and those guys. And really the only one who's shown that he's capable of competing with the Kenyans and the Ethiopians right now. Um, here he is at the men's Olympic marathon trials last year in, in Central Park. Um, he, he won easily in two hours and nine minutes, shattering the American record for the trials. Um, it's one of the most incredible sporting events I've witnessed firsthand. There's a loop course in Central Park, so they just these amazing runners just kept running past you. And he was barely sweating. It barely seemed like he was even running that hard. Um, and he, he just had one of those days... Um, you, could, you could just, it was kind of awe-inspiring, really. Um, his PR for the marathon is actually 2.06. That's a 4-minute and 49-minute per mile pace, if you can imagine that, for 26.2 miles. Um, after he won this race, um, Mary Wittenberg, who's the race director of New York, um, kind of captured Ryan, saying, he's better than anyone we've ever seen. He expresses himself through running unlike anyone else. When he runs, it's like his soul pops out. Um, he, he had a disappointing Olympics in Beijing. I think he finished 13th. He ran Boston this past April and finished third after leading um, for a lot of the race and was edged out by um, two East Africans. But he, he's just a sublime athlete, and it's more than just the physical ability. He's very, very spiritual and very intelligent, um, and he just brings that together in a way that I haven't seen before. But I also wanted to just tell you a little bit about this guy who you may know, um, Dean Carnazis. Uh, he was a runner as a kid. He ran cross country in high school growing up, and he showed that he was unusual pretty early. Um, he wanted to go to a skateboard park when he was a kid. He was 30 miles from home, but nobody would give him a ride. And eight hours later, the phone rang, and it was Dean. He had ridden his skateboard to the park and now needed to ride home. Um, he went on to kind of, you know, lead a normal life, went to college, got an MBA, marketing job at a pharmaceutical company, got married. Um, but looking back, he says he felt like he was just kind of, you know, doing it all for a paycheck. Um, there was a real lack of intensity in my life. He says, I, it was boring. I was bored. And the night before his 30th birthday, he celebrated by getting drunk at a San Francisco club with a bunch of friends. Um, and later that night, he was drunk and depressed in the midst of what he now says was a midlife crisis. He walked home, um, and when he got home, he um, stripped down to his T-shirt and boxers and <laughs> put on a pair of old sneakers and just started running for the first time in a decade or so. And he didn't stop. And they live in San Francisco. He didn't stop until he'd reached Half Moon Bay, which is 30 miles away. All my senses just came alive. He said, I knew something big was happening. Um, he quit his job and began focusing on running, running marathons and ultra marathons, just trying to um, throw himself at the most intense events he could find. Um, he's won the Badwater Ultra Marathon, which is 135 miles from Death Valley up to the top of Mount Whitney. Um, it's run in July when um, temperatures spike at about 130 degrees. This is him doing it. They run on the white line because if you run on the blacktop, it will melt your shoes. That's true. Um, he's, he's run Badwater several times um, and just countless other races. Um, he, he's, a, he's a family man now with, with a couple of kids. He started his own natural food company. He loves to run in the middle of the night. So he's, he'll put his kids to bed, and then he'll go running. And he'll do that on a Friday night, and he'll run all through the night, and then um, the, the family will wake up, and they'll drive, and they'll go meet him wherever they are, and they'll spend the weekend there. Um, to <laughs> He's trained his body to only require a few hours of sleep. He sets his alarm at 2 a.m. to go running, and then he just sort of goes about his day. Um, he wrote a book about his transformation and about ultra running. It's called Ultra Marathon Man, which is a surprise bestseller, and it really put ultra marathoning into the culture in a bigger way than, than before. Um, his favorite thing, one of his favorite things to do is, was to enter long relay races, like 200 miles that 12 people do as a team, and run them by, him, by himself. Um, in 2005, he ran 350 miles without stopping. Um, it took him 81 hours. 
he dropped his kids off at school on a Wednesday morning and just started running and didn't stop until Saturday. Um, it, we interviewed him. I, we called him on his cell phone a dozen or so times throughout the course of that to see how it was going. Um, it, he says the key to running 350 miles is to just do it 10 feet at a time. Um, you just run to the next light pole or the next tree, um, and you just you never think oh, I have you know 240 miles to go. Um, when he's running these crazy distances, he calls ahead. He's got all these places that he knows now. He'll order pizzas and burritos and entire cheesecakes, and they just bring them to him on the side of the road, and he scarfs them down um, while he's running without stopping. Um, but the, the, the biggest and kind of coolest thing that he's done so far, uh, he did it a couple of years ago, and, and he realized that he was doing all these things kind of on his own, and he, he had an organization that he founded called Carno Kids, which is meant to fight childhood obesity, but he wanted to sort of reach more people, so um, they did this thing called the 50-50-50, and he, he ran 50 marathons in all 50 states in 50 consecutive days, and this was an illustration that we had in the magazine that sort of shows what his order was. Um, I, I went to meet him on this, on this thing that he did in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which was my hometown. Um, so I, I, I sort of saw this up close. Um, they weren't races. They, they, they kind of called them fun runs. There were no clocks or anything. But it really was like communion almost. People came from all over the world, um, not just to meet him, but to run with him. Oh, yeah, it, it got hot out there, too. So at times he had to you know, resort to extreme measures. They, they just wanted to run with Dean, you know, the way a Beatles fan would want to, you know, do karaoke with Paul McCartney or something. I don't know. Um, most had already read his book, and they would just come up to Dean during the runs and tell him how inspiring he is and how he helped them change their own lives through running, whether it was beating cancer or quit drinking or, or just to begin exercising for the, for the first time. This is Matt Long. Um, he, he really had life by the horns. He was a firefighter in New York City. He was an Ironman triathlete, and he just run his first New York marathon. Um, this was in 2005, qualifying for Boston on his first try. Um, in December of that year, there was a transit strike in New York, so he had to ride his bike to the station, and he figured he would just get in some, some cycling training. Uh, instead, he got run over by a city bus. Um, he was pinned underneath, and the handlebars of his bike pierced his abdomen. Uh, rescuers had to saw the bike apart to get him out. Uh, he lost an astonishing amount of blood, and when he arrived at the ER, ER doctors thought he maybe had a 5% chance of surviving. Um, in addition to the blood loss, he um, suffered grave injuries, compound fractures in his left leg, fractured shoulder, fractured hip, uh, a crushed pelvis with uh, really severe uh, pelvic nerve damage. Um, and the only reason doctors think he survived at all is because he was so fit. Um, he was in the hospital for five months. He lost 50 pounds, most of it muscle. Um, that picture that you just saw was him after the surgery. Um, I'm sorry, it was recent. It was just last year. This is him when he was discharged from the hospital after five months. Um, he had, over the next two years, 40 surgeries uh, and basically had to learn how to walk again um, and, and really live again. Being, being a runner and an athlete and a firefighter was his complete identity, and he was none of those things anymore. Um, he had really lost um, his sense of himself when he became uh, disabled. He had a titanium rod in his left leg. His right leg was two inches shorter than his left, um, and the abductor muscles in his right hip were, were totally powerless. Um, and after a really, really difficult two-year stretch, lots of um, depression, he kind of um, detached completely from his friends and family. Um, he decided that the only way that he was going to be able to make it is to, was to become an athlete again. Um, so he set a, a goal to run the six-mile loop in Central Park with his, with his running buddies. Um, but at some point, it, I guess, just seemed too small to him. He didn't feel like that would signify that he was back as an athlete in the way that he wanted to. Um, so he decided to run the New York Marathon again. Um, this was a guy who didn't even know how to run again yet. Um, and in a, over 11 months, he relearned. He relearned how to walk and, and how, to, how to run. He's got an incredibly painful gait because of the titanium rod in his leg and the leg length discrepancy and, 
um, everything that I mentioned before. It's painful to watch him run. He started in the hallway of his apartment building at night with his hands on one wall and eventually did make it out into the park to actually do some real training. Um, and nobody knew what to expect when he, when he lined up in Staten Island this past November to run New York uh, with a bunch of friends from the FDNY. Um, they set out at a painfully slow pace, about 17 minutes per mile, which is really all Matt can do. Um, he had legions of people uh, cheering for him along the way. Um, this was one of the races that, as Rob mentioned, I was working as a reporter on the NBC broadcast, um, and, and I saw these people out. It was a big story in New York. I saw all these people out cheering for Matt. It was another one of those like walls of sound, you know, just moving along the course. Um, this is Matt's parents here. He's stopping um, to say hello to them. That's his mom on the right. Um, I have um, stood at the finish line of New York many, many, many times. And those of you who've done that, something similar know that the whole spectrum of humanity is out there, you know, right before your eyes, um, playing itself out. People are cheering. People are crying. They're laughing. They're bleeding. They're crawling. They're happy. They're devastated. Just everything right there. You can not move and see it all go by. Um, but Matt's finish is, is the most incredible that I've seen. And I'm after, this, is, this closes uh, the talk. And um, be happy to take some questions if anybody wants to afterwards. <laughs>